Good evening. My name is Arthur Levin. I'm president of the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. And on behalf of the Society, I'd like to welcome all of you, members, friends, awardees, friends of awardees, family of awardees, uh, to the 32nd annual meeting and the presentation of the 2012 Village Awards. First part of the evening is actually an annual meeting. We have some business to do. Uh, the rest of the evening is, is the pleasurable part of uh, the awards, which I'm sure you'll all enjoy. And those of you who have been here in years past know how pleasant an event this is. So let me uh, introduce uh, someone who needs no introduction to most of you or all of you, uh, our executive director, Andrew Berman, who will give an annual report. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for that warm welcome and a warm welcome right back to you. Uh, we want to welcome everyone to GVSHP's 32nd annual annual meeting and our 22nd annual awards. Um, and as always, it's really wonderful to see such uh, good old friends here as well as a lot of new faces, which is really a big part of what this evening's all about. Uh, a couple of thank yous before we get started. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the New School for hosting us tonight in the beautiful, landmarked Tishman Auditorium. Um, I would also, yes. I'd also like to, uh, first of all, thank and acknowledge the GVSHP staff, who are a really incredible, hardworking group of people who make what, we've, what we're doing tonight and everything that we're going to talk about possible. So I'd like, uh, actually I see they're all right there in the back, Cheryl Woodruff, if you could raise your hand. Dana Schultz, next to her. Amanda Davis. Andito Lloyd. And Drew Derniak. They really do. They do. They really do an incredible job. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank and acknowledge, of course, all of the GVSHP trustees who worked so hard throughout the year for the organization. Can I just ask you all, those who are here, to raise their hand? The And of course, our awards committee, which worked so hard to sort through the, um, the literally hundreds of compelling nominations that we get every year to select this year's uh, awardees. If everybody from the uh, awards committee could just raise their hand. Thank you too so much for your, uh, for your hard work. So we have some business to attend to shortly, and of course, some wonderful awards to give out to some brilliant and distinguished awardees. But right now, I have the pleasure of recapping the last year in the life of the Greenwich Village Society. It's been a year of great accomplishments as well as challenges for GVSHP. In May, after a six-year effort, we finally secured landmark designation for 128 East 13th Street. As many of you know, this was an especially gratifying victory given how close we came to losing this wonderful building. GVSHP's ongoing research on the history of every building in our neighborhood had uncovered that 128 East 13th Street was built in 1903 as the Van Tassel and Kearney Horse Auction Mart, a, pl a place where the Vanderbilts and Delanos came to purchase polo ponies and show horses. This building is likely the only surviving horse auction mart left in New York City, a once common building type in New York. But our research had also shown that during World War II, the building housed an assembly line training center for women, and from 1978 to 2005 was the studio of, of renowned artist Frank Stella. Because GVSHP monitors every building and demolition application in our neighborhoods, in 2006, we were able to uncover a plan to demolish this building by a new owner just before it got approval. Armed with our research documenting the building's significance, we immediately called upon the city to hold an emergency hearing on landmark designation, which they did. Inspired by the building's World War II history, we spawned a campaign to save 128 East 13th Street. The commission held the emergency hearing and prevented, landmark de prevented demolition from taking place. 
But for six long years, they hesitated to landmark the structure, even as GVSHP and others called upon them to act. This spring, they finally did, and 128 East 13th Street, our city's newest landmark, should now be safe for generations to come. And I know many of you here wrote those letters and attended those hearings, so thank you very much. There were many other preservation victories to celebrate. In October, the city finally landmarked West Beth, a pioneering example of adaptive reuse of industrial buildings for artists' housing, which GVSHP had studied, documented, and proposed for landmark designation. In January, the city designated the first new historic district in the East Village since 1969 along Tompkins Square North. Here, too, the emergency hearing and vote was sparked by GVSHP's discovery of a plan by a developer to compromise a building in the middle of the proposed district. That plan has now been stopped. In March of this year, GVSHP got a boost in our effort to save the South Village when the Preservation League of New York State accepted our nomination of the neighborhood as one of its seven to save, its biannual list of the seven most important and historically significant endangered sites in New York State. While the first third of our proposed South Village Historic District was designated in 2003, the largest expansion of landmark protections in Greenwich Village since 1969, the remaining two-thirds are still quite vulnerable, and we push the city to follow through on its promise to consider this area for landmark designation as well. GBSHP was also able to help stop out-of-scale and inappropriate rooftop additions proposed for the Puck Building on Lafayette Street, one of New York's most beloved landmarks. While the city ultimately approved a vastly scaled-back version we were able to get these prior larger iterations rejected four successive times. And we hope more victories are near on the horizon. On June 26th, the city will hold a hearing on a proposed 300 plus building East Village Lower East Side Historic District, which includes many historic sites GVSHP has fought to protect. This includes the Mesrich Synagogue, the East Village's last operating tenement synagogue, and the district was also expanded to include many other sites for which GVSHP had also sought landmark protection, including 101 Avenue A, there on the left, the home of the Pyramid Club, and the Russian Orthodox Cathedral at 59 East 2nd Street. Talk about an odd couple. <laughs> but there were challenges as well. A developer is seeking to upzone Chelsea Market to allow the addition of two large office and hotel towers atop the historic complex. Over the objections of GVSHP and our Chelsea allies, last night the community board narrowly defeated a resolution to reject the proposal and instead passed one granting conditional approval for the development tied to some changes in the project scope and a contribution to an off-site affordable housing fund. But that battle is far from over. Earlier this year, GVSHP's objections over GVSHP's objections, the city approved the Rudin rezoning and condo development plan for the former St. Vincent's Hospital. A bright note, however, was that while we were not able to stop the granting of zoning privileges originally intended for a hospital to a condo development, we were able to help scale down and redesign the development considerably, including the partial preservation of one additional building, the Reese Building, bringing the total number to five of buildings we helped ensure were saved on the former hospital's East Campus. The final outcome still remains to be seen, however, with the 800-pound gorilla of them all, NYU's massive proposed village expansion plan. Really? I'm so surprised to hear that reaction. GVSHP has helped lead the charge against this plan, and the university has been forced to remove many particularly egregious element, elements. A proposed fourth 400-foot-tall tower in the Silver Towers complex has been removed, a hotel use on Mercer Street, a freshman dorm above a possible elementary school on Bleecker Street. Yes, 
great idea. Several, uh, several public park spaces NYU intended to take over, and a commercial overlay covering nine blocks east, east of Washington Square have all been removed from the plan. Overall, the university has been forced to scale back its proposal by about 20%. However, in approving the other 80% or so of the plan, the Manhattan Borough President and the City Planning Commission are still okaying the destruction of public parkland, letting NYU build on formerly public land given to them 50 years ago under the condition that it remain open space in perpetuity, and allowing NYU to become an ever more overwhelming presence in the village rather than finding alternative outlets for its growth. The fight now goes to the city council, where GVSHP will educate council members from across the boroughs about the flaws in the NYU plan and the alternatives they have ignored. In this case as well, the fight is not over. Of course, GVSHP's educational efforts are hardly limited to our public officials. Our children's education program, History and Historic Preservation, entered its 21st year and continues to grow. The program, which uses the village as a living classroom in which children learn how history can be found and preserved in their surroundings, is for the first time ever being taught in all five boroughs at once. In just the last year, the number of schools requesting scholarships from GBSHP to participate in the program has jumped from three to 25. I'm proud to say that thanks to the generosity of our members and funders, we were able to accommodate every single request. And in case it isn't clear, so these are all the schools throughout the five boroughs that we've been serving. This year, GVSHP launched several new educational programs for adults and the general public. We've begun a historic plaque program to recognize the many sites of special historic, architectural, and cultural significance in the village, East Village, and NoHo. Our, our inaugural plaque unveiling at the site of the former Eustace Schwab Saloon on East First Street, which was a locus of radical and anarchist activity on the Lower East Side in the late 19th century, frequented by Emma Goldman and Samuel Gompers, was a wonderful community celebration. We were joined by our co-sponsors, Two Boots, the First Street Community Garden, and more than 100 friends and neighbors. More unveilings are planned soon. Through our broker's partnership, GVSHP launched our first ever continuing education program. Certified by the state, it allows brokers to earn credits towards their licenses while learning about historic preservation and the history of development in our downtown neighborhoods. Classes last fall and this spring filled to capacity almost immediately. And I want to extend a, a special thank you to our brokers partnership for their great work in doing this. Um, this is so important because it allows us to educate a very important class of people who have an enormous impact on the shape that our neighborhoods take and to um, make them even more familiar with historic preservation and its importance. Our Brokers Partnership also put together one of the first programs in the city commemorating the centennial of the sinking of the Titanic. The event focused on the village connections of this momentous event taking place in the ballroom of the Jane Hotel where ti Titanic survivors had been taken after docking at Pier 54 at Little West 12th Street. Our ongoing programming continued to expand, serving more than 3,000 people last year. For the first time, we instituted a limited number of members-only programs to ensure that our strongest supporters could have access to these wonderful and free, but increasingly in-demand events. And we began running encore performances of some of our most popular lectures and tours to accommodate the sometimes overwhelming public demand. GBSHP continued to educate the public about the public review and approval process for proposed developments and other changes in our neighborhoods, both big and small. 
A town hall meeting on the proposed NYU expansion plan in January attracted an overflow crowd of more than 500. And by the way, um, I'm sure a lot of you were there. For those of you who weren't, I'm not sure this picture does it justice, all those folks are standing in the front by the podium because there was no place else for them to stand. Um, it, was, uh, it was really a great evening with a lot of energy and people getting incredibly organized and involved in this fight. In January, uh, in March rather of this year, GVSHP joined with local block associations about a proposed Hudson Square rezoning, which attracted more than 100 residents to learn more about an important plan to rezone more than 20 blocks of our neighborhood, the details of which neighborhood residents had previously been largely unaware of. As a result, a consensus formed among community groups and neighbors to push for lower height limits and landmark protections in conjunction with the possible rezoning of this area west of 6th Avenue and south of Houston Street. And that's a, that's a big project that's just at the beginning stages, so stay tuned for what will be happening there. GBSHP's Landmarks application webpage continued to serve as an invaluable tool to anyone interested in proposed changes to landmark properties in the Village, East Village, and NoHo. The only such webpage of its kind in the city, it provides images and details of every single application for changes to landmark properties in our neighborhood that is significant enough to warrant a public hearing. So in other words, if there is any building anywhere in our neighborhood that falls under landmark regulation and somebody is seeking to change it and it has to go through a public hearing, you can go to this page and find out exactly what's going on with it. With a few clicks, now anyone can learn what changes are being proposed to buildings in our neighborhoods, when public hearings on the changes are being held, and how you can weigh in on the application before decisions are made. While decisions and changes in status of any application are posted on the website as soon as they have been made, you can also sign up to receive updates about any application. So you don't even need to check, but simply wait for an email linking you to the updated page. With so much going on in our lives, there's no easier way to keep informed about what's going on in your neighborhood. Engaging the public in the preservation and development of our neighborhoods, past, present, and future, remains the number one priority for GVSHP. Thanks to you, our friends and supporters, we are better equipped than ever to do so in a constantly changing and challenging landscape. Today, more than ever, we at the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation salute you, our members, for your support, your commitment, your participation, and your passion. It makes everything that we do possible. Thank you very much, and now on with our annual Village Awards I hope you'll enjoy the evening. Marianne Arisman will now join us. The business part of the meeting will just take a moment. GVSHP's nominating committee is entrusted with the task of searching out new members for our board of trustees and confirming the continuing engagement of current trustees whose terms do for renewal. This year, we are saying goodbye to two of our trustees. Vals Osborne began her service to GVSHP as a member of the Benefit Committee in 2005, serving on the committee through this year. In 2006, she helped form the Broker Partnership, which you just heard so much about, a very, very successful group. It's a group of downtown real estate brokers who organize relevant educational programs, plan outreach activities, and raise funds in support of the society. A village resident for many years, Jonathan Russo, joined our board in 1997. He served as chair of the programs committee for many years, and through his service on the finance committee, assisted the organization in moving funds into higher yield accounts. Many, many thanks to both Fals and Jonathan for their many years of service to the organization. And it is now with great pleasure that I present the recommendations of the GVSHP's nominating committee's slate of trustees to be voted on by all GVSHP members this evening. A reminder that all dues-paying members received a small paddle 
when you enter to indicate your vote. So when I call for the vote, please raise your paddle in the air. Um, first, I present to you the slate of trustees renewing for a three-year term. These candidates have already been serving on the board and are renewing their candidacy. Please stand when I say your name. Mary Ann Arisman, of course I'm standing. Uh, <laughs> Arthur Levin, Judith Stonehill, and Lindy Yoel. All in favor of this slate. Any against? The slate is approved. Thank you. Next, I'm pleased to present one new candidate for a three-year term for the board. GBSHP member Tom Burchard is the owner of Veselka, a family-owned business established in 1954 and the new Veselka Bowery. Tom has a long connection to the East Village. He began working at Veselka in 1967 and lived in the neighborhood for 35 years. Tom has served on the GBSHP Awards Committee for the past two years. He was a founding member of the East Village Parks Conservancy and the Second Avenue Merchants Association. He's a graduate of Rutgers College and currently lives just outside the East Village with his wife, Sally. All in favor of um, our proposed newest board member. Any opposed? Thank you. The slate is approved. Thank you very much. And it is now my pleasure to uh, introduce the presenter of tonight's Village Awards program. Please join me in welcoming Calvin Trillin. Thank you, Andrew. I, uh, I was reminded when Andrew gave that uh, talk about uh, the green space being guaranteed to kept green in perpetuity, something I read in the Times some years ago, a development man was talking to a prospective donor in one of the great cultural institutions, and he said, if you gave this amount of money, we would be willing to name this facility for you and your family in perpetuity. And the prospective donor said, just out of curiosity, how many years is perpetuity these days? <laughs> the development man said, ordinarily 50, but for you, 75. Uh, it's a New York story. Um, I'm always reminded when I come here of what uh, Kenny Shopson, whose restaurant used to be on Morton and Bedford, said when I was interviewing him about the village, and I said, what's the difference between the village and uptown, Kenny? And Kenny said, I don't know, I've never been uptown. <laughs> uh, 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 but I think it's an occasion for us to uh, remember how fortunate we are to live here. I, um, my girls, my family grew up in the village. Um, my girls used to come home from college for the uh, Halloween parade, um, and they went to PS3. And I, um, of course, when I was when when they were growing up, the Halloween I was, and we used to go in the, Hall in the Halloween parade every year. I was also writing a column for the Nation, and sometimes I mentioned someone I called Harold the Committed. Uh, he didn't think I was raising the girls with enough political content. And uh, he wanted my older daughter to go to the Halloween parade as Emma Goldman. Um, um, she decided to go as a box of M&Ms that year. Uh, he wanted my younger daughter to go as the dangers posed to our society by the military-industrial complex. 
I said, Harold, we don't have anybody at home who can sew that well. <laughs> um, but it's always a pleasure to give these awards. Um, this year, the first one is to the Lower East Side History Project. which was begun as a, as a website um, by Eric Ferreira, who was a, a fourth generation resident of the Lower East Side. Uh, I'm amazed at that. I, uh, I remember when the first, the first time a Lower East Side ap apartment uh, was sold for a million dollars, and I said, I hope whoever paid a million dollars for apartment, I hope his old grandfather's not still alive. Uh, he'll say, you did what? Um, at any rate, the, it went from a website uh, to an educational program, to public walking tours. Um, and now, it, it then uh, launched the East Village Visitor Center in conjunction with the Bowery Poetry Club at 308 Bowery. And uh, the center is now open five days a week, and it serves as a neighborhood information center and, of course, cafe. Uh, the research people at the um, Lower East Side History Project have uh, done research on all facets of, these, of the neighborhoods. Uh, the Lower East Side is now thought to consider the East Village, Alphabet City, the Bowery, Chinatown, Little Italy. And they've uh, done books, including on the history of the mafia in the neighborhood and the history of the Bowery, uh, which is colorful. Um, a village award is presented to the Lower East Side Project for researching, documenting, and preserving the distinctive history of the East Village and Lower East Side and engaging the public with the neighborhood's history. Eric Ferrara, founder and executive director director will accept the award this evening. Mr. Farrar. Thank, Thank you very much. You know, my grandmother had a chance to buy her building for $20,000 back in 1968. Now it's on the market for about $4.5 million over on Suffolk Street. But it's an honor to be here. Actually, I was sitting in this audience six years ago, and I said, I'm going to win one of those awards within five years. It took six years for everyone to catch up with my own dreams, but here I am. And it's truly an honor uh, to accept on behalf of Lower East Side History Project. And as multi-generational New Yorkers or pre-gentrification New Yorkers, it's very important to keep the history, spirit, and culture of old New York alive. So I really do appreciate this, uh, to be nominated alongside such great institutions uh, and individuals. And to all the supporters and friends and everybody out here and GVSHP, keep up the good fight. And thank you very much. Our next award goes to uh, Arturo's. Um, it's, um, it's kind of a leitmotif, I think, this evening is, um, uh, has to do with buying the building. Um, I had occasion once to uh, talk to uh, the proprietor of Le Grenouille, who the second or third generation proprietor, I guess second generation proprietor, and they're sort of the surviving uh, uh, one of the, what used to be a number of uh, sort of grand French restaurants. And, uh, and of course their food is exquisite, the, the service is great, but um, the secret is they, they own the building. Um, <laughs> And that is also true uh, of Arthur uh, and Betty Junta. Uh, they started, um, they each borrowed money from their families and purchased equipment 
from a dealer on the Bowery and started their pizza parlor in 1957. That's a great picture. Um, um, Betty was born and raised in the village. Uh, and despite having a maiden name of Keefe, which does not sound very pizza-like to me, um, uh, she sang at the uh, Amato Opera, and uh, it's said that she saw Arturo while she was on a date with another man. <laughs> After telling her date, she just saw the man she was going to marry. <laughs> it's been a letdown for him, I think. <laughs> Not a good way to start the evening. Um, she began frequenting Frank's Pizza, which is where Arturo worked. Um, and they moved to their current location on Houston and Thompson. Uh, and then they purchased the building. That's the secret of the village in, 19, in the 1970s and began hosting nightly jazz at the restaurant. Uh, the Junta children, Scott and Lisa, both went to school in the neighborhood and began working at the restaurant and are still working at the restaurant. Arturo's Restaurant is presented a village award for 55 years of delicious coal-fired pizza and Italian food, warm hospitality, and service to the community by a family-owned South Village restaurant. Accepting the award this, ev this evening is Arturo and Betty's daughter, Lisa Junta. Thank you so much, everyone. It's such an honor to be here tonight. I imagine all this started with my dad's dream after serving his country in World War II. He got a job with Sal Petrillo at Frank's Pizzeria on Bleecker Street. He became a waiter and later wanted to learn how to cook. History was starting right now. He then met my mom, a young opera starlet from Tony Amato's Opera Company at the circle in the square that was on Bleecker Street. Well, the two kids from Greenwich Village fell in love and opened up Arturo's restaurant in the summer of 57, six months before they were married. Pretty amazing, huh? Our first location was at 51 MacDougal Street, and we later moved in 63 to 106 West Houston Street. It has been a distinct pleasure to serve our community for 55 years. The Arturas family is greatly, greatly honored to receive this award. It has been an amazing journey of magic and miracles, and we look forward to what lies ahead in the future. I thank you and God bless you all. <laughs> Glad to see some Arturo's fans could make it tonight. I... <laughs> Our next award is to the 6th Street and Avenue B Garden. The 6th Street and Avenue B Garden was developed beginning in 1982 when a committee of the 6th Street AB Block Association fought to turn six lots of abandoned, derelict buildings and garbage strewn lots into usable community space. Wow. Um, within a year, the lease secured from the city's Green Thumb program. They marked off four by eight plots for garden members to plant. And the, um, like many community gardens, the 6th and B members had to continually struggle to keep the space from being reclaimed by the city. Or twice petitioned the, developers twice petitioned the city to build, once as a parking lot, and once for a high-end housing development. 
Garden members eventually won the community to their side by opening their gates to the public, sponsoring programs, and demonstrating the importance of green space. Today, the Garden hosts approximately 75 public events during the year, from Shakespeare readings to Friday night movies. It also opens the general public during the summer and fall seasons on weekends. In addition, the Garden has developed a relationship with three local preschools to welcome the children to the Garden. The Garden welcomes membership for residents who live between 14th and Delancey Streets, between the East River and Broadway, for a fee of $5 a year. Garden members volunteer their times, not just developing their own plots, but in planning programs and staffing the Garden's open hours. For creating an extraordinary green and open communal space where there was once only rubble, and for opening an artistic set of gates to the public for the past 30 years, the 6th and B Garden is presented a Village Award. Marilyn Whitesides, current president of the Garden, will accept the award this evening. Thank you so very much. I moved to New York City in the early 70s. A realtor told me he had a nice family building across from a city park. It turned out to be Tompkins Square Park. <laughs> and he was the only family. And they moved to Connecticut a month later. And I was terrified. But, I'm, but I had the good fortune of making a friend who said to me, have you seen that garden on the corner of 6th and B? And I went around there and it was just unbelievably lush. There were huge tomatoes, cucumbers, cantaloupes, trees, shrubs, flowers, and my life was changed. I've made so many wonderful friends from all over the world, not to mention New York and the States. And we have wonderful events that are free to the public all through the summer. It's a marvelous place to come and be cool when you're hot. And it, I don't know what more to say about it. I, some people were walking by originally and saw a little tomato pl plant sprouting up amongst that huge pile of rubble that you saw. And they started digging and planting. And that person that saw that tomato plant was Joni Freedom, and I would like for her to stand up. Thank you, Joni, very much. And thank you all. This is wonderful. The Regina Kellerman Award is presented each year in honor of the Society's first executive director, who dedicated her career to the preservation of the architecture and built environment of the village. Um, this year it goes to the Bleecker Street sitting area renovation at 11th and Bleecker. Um, there was something there, um, a small park created in 1966 that had fallen in uh, complete disrepair, as had some of the uh, trees and shrubbery around it. And in 2009, village resident, a private citizen, Clifford Ross, began to pr pursue a much needed renovation. He met with the Parks Department, City Council, Speaker Christine Quinn, and Borough President Scott Stringer, offering to help secure private funds for the project of the city would, if the city would pledge some public funding and commit to a renovation. This is the park, by the way, that's right next to that Bleecker Street playground, which my grandsons call Noisy Park. Because um, it's, and they call the one on St. Luke's Place Quiet Park. Um, the, um, so our family is very familiar with it, and I believe it is where, in the old village parade before it went to 6th Avenue, where PS41 used to have a coven of witches to meet the paraders. Uh, so it's an important area. Um, 
Speaker Quinn uh, and President uh, Borough President Stringer offered to help secure private, uh, offered, pledge some public funding and commit to a renovation. And uh, Ross doubled this money through a gift from the Pestrum Foundation. Senior landscape architect Gail Witter Laird of the New York Parks Department was given the undertaking of creating a redesign. She met with the community. Um, one of the most renovations, most successful qualities is a retention of openness between the sidewalks and park, preserving the park's function as an open public square. The place is even ADA accessible and important concern for the community. The success of this renovation project has yet another important benefit, and I think this is really uh, something that we think about in all of these projects. Ross plans to continue the partnership with park, the Parks Department, bringing long overdue park renovation projects to less affluent neighborhoods. The Regina Kellerman Award goes to the renovation of the Bleecker Street sitting area for the extraordinary transformation of a public space made possible through the persistence of the community and a public-private partnership. Accepting the award this evening is Manhattan Parks Commissioner William Castro, Gail Witter Laird, the designer, and the instigator of all of this, Clifford Ross. Thank you so much for this honor. Commissioner Benepe could not be here tonight, but it is quite an honor for us to accept this award. And the public-private partnership is a very important aspect to government now throughout the country, but especially here in New York. And Clifford Ross has been an outstanding public citizen. Uh, his father was for many years, and he's, he's taken that on it as well. I want to thank him so much for his leadership. And I also want to thank our speaker and our president for what they have done to make this possible. And of course, someone I've known for a while, Gail Whitwer Laird, a beautiful uh, design, and she is remarkable in her abilities to transform public spaces into things of beauty. And I'd like to have her say a few words now. Thank you, um, Commissioner Castro. Let me move a little closer. Uh, I think you started by saying that this happened um, with one person, and I think uh, it's one person and a village. Uh, I think um, uh, I will say thank you to Commissioner Bennett B and Commissioner Castro for assigning me the project. Um, it was a tricky one. Uh, it's, it's hard to make change and make everybody happy with change as a designer, as everyone here knows. Um, and I'd also like to thank Clifford Ross um, for his unyielding support throughout the entire process. Uh, I think, um, you know, him noticing all of the things happening up and down the west side, all over the village, and realizing that the space on his block was kind of forgotten, and um, its time was long overdue. And when he approached the Parks Department and said, well, do you have any plans? Are you going to do anything? We're, no. <laughs> We don't do anything unless we're kind of nudged really hard or pushed or something. Something has to give. So it really did come down to Clifford and the Parks Department in the village <laughs> altogether. So um, I'd also like to thank, uh, during the process, the, the input from the community. I met with the mothers group, the Bleecker Street Playground Mothers Group, who um, encouraged us to add more lighting and uh, um, the community board won for giving their input into the design. And also the contractor, um, uh, Sam Chavon of Vernon Hills Construction, who uh, gave a great attention to detail, went the extra mile um, with the project and completed it on time and on budget, which we can't say for every project. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little, I'm sure you know more history than me here, but um, I think the history of this site is very interesting because it's a relatively recent history in the context of the village. Um, 
and I have a special affinity uh, for the year that the property came to the Parks Department because it was the year I was born. <laughs> so I feel like uh, the site and I grew up in parallel lives and have come together at this time. Um, the land it, it was turned to the, over to the Parks Department in 1963 because uh, the Department of Transportation wanted to widen Bleecker Street and, um, uh, and eliminate part of the bed of Bank Street. And at that time, there were no um, playgrounds or open spaces in, in the immediate vicinity of the neighborhood. And, and the community members got together and said, if you're going to widen the street and tear down these buildings, at the very least, you have to give us something back. You have to make us a playground. So as part of community involvement um, and lobbying the city successfully, the space was created um, in this relatively recent history. And uh, amazingly enough, it had been untouched since then. So it was, it was really interesting to come into this project. After everything around it has changed, it hadn't. And, and one of the reasons it hadn't changed it, I think we had plans at one point in time, and no one wanted to change it because it had a very special quality. And Calvin mentioned that, and that quality is that it's, it's open. There's no edge between park and city. There's somehow, there's no gate, there's no, there's no fence. And that blurring of the edges between the, the, the park space and the city is, is what made this space so special. And it was very important to me and to the community expressed it Every time I met with someone, Deborah Glick actually set up a, a special meeting to make me promise I wouldn't gate and fence it. And, and, um, and I, I think that, that that was there for me too, because that, that's what makes the space unique from other parks, is, is, is its openness. And um, so with that, I'd like to, to turn it over to uh, Clifford Ross, who, who really, we wouldn't have that space without. Um, thank you to the Society for this uh, award. I cannot believe I get to live um, in Greenwich Village. Um, I really, I grew up in New York and it was sort of mythic to me. Uh, it was like the Marais in Paris. And uh, getting to live here um, really was such a gift. Um, it was a no-brainer to realize that um, I'd end up feeling better if I could give something back. And the joy, honestly, of working, it, it literally was a phone call to Commissioner Benepe that got this going. And then Bill and Gail, uh, Speaker Quinn, it was incredible. And um, I think, although to me it seemed like it took a long time and I was an incredible and endless nudge uh, to, to keep it going, um, it went incredibly quickly. Um, it was um, really deliberate that the People and the residents in the area were satisfied with Gail's designs. And so I think uh, Gail and, and Bill and the commissioner, uh, Benepe, really deserve um, a special appreciation for their sensitivity as public officials uh, to listening to the residents. Um, it was a great education for me. And what I'm going to do with this education now is um, I was thinking my neighborhood was the village, which it is. But um, I came to realize how satisfying working in my neighborhood could be. I also came to realize that my neighborhood is New York City. And as uh, was mentioned before, what we plan to do next is to find the most uh, underserved spot we could find in the five boroughs. And we want to do to that spot what we did to Bleecker Street. Uh, we want to take the same kind of care. And I think it's useful for us all as we take care of each other in Greenwich Village, is um, to spend a little bit of our energy also taking care uh, of those that aren't as lucky as we are to live in, in Greenwich Village. So thank you to the society very much, and thank you. Thank you. It's a Another reminder that the village is more, than, I usually describe the village as a neighborhood where uh, people from the suburbs come on Saturday night to test their car alarms. Um, uh, but as you just heard, it's more than that. Um, our next award is for the Foods of New York Tours, um, which started by Todd Lefkowick. Um, as a sideline, ooh, there's their, their logo, um, 
And after a year of that, he quit his day job and officially launched the company. Now Foods of New York has 17 employees and five separate tour offerings, conducting about 50 tours per week during their busiest season. Um, I think that probably in the village they stop at a lot of places that have gotten awards from the Greenwich Village Society for Historical Preservation. Um, yeah, there, there's FICOs, where I think they were here a year or two ago. Um, they now have uh, tours of Chelsea Market, Central Village, NoHo, and even Chinatown. Um, and the, um, in addition to sampling some of our neighborhood's best food offerings, guides also emphasize the area's history and culture. A recent tour included an explanation of the different kinds of brickwork on federal and Greek revival houses. Uh, neither of those kinds are edible. Um, <laughs> tastings are selected after months of research uh, by Todd and Operation uh, Director um, Amy Bandolito. Um, that's a test. <laughs> Foods of New York Tours is presented with a Village Award for exceptional dedication to promoting and showcasing local village businesses while educating the public about the history, architecture, and culture of the neighborhood. Todd Lefkovic and Amy Bandolito will be accepting the award this evening. Uh, thank you very much. Um, this actually started in 1975. Uh, even though that says 1999, uh, a quick story. In 1975, uh, my sixth grade teacher was talking about Jack Kerouac. And I listened to the story, and something sparked my interest because they kept saying what he did, and he, they kept saying Greenwich Village. So. At 13 years old, I wanted to come in without my parents. Unfortunately, I didn't think it was a good idea. So what I actually did was I waited till 1977, and I was 15. And at that point, I said, OK, I'm going to grab three friends, $5 each, and we're going to go to Greenwich Village. So the first Saturday that we did that, uh, we ended up Port Authority, 42nd Street, not Greenwich Village. <laughs> so a woman that saw four 15-year-olds came up to us and actually said, what are you guys doing here? And I said, we're looking for Greenwich Village. She said, you're not in the right place. But at that point, we kind of liked what we saw. Coming, I'm originally from Cranford, New Jersey, if anybody knows that. It doesn't look like 42nd Street in 1977. So, she was kind enough to actually walk us to Fifth Avenue. She directed us, directed us downtown, and she said, what you want to do, you want to look for a big white arch. And she said, that is it right there. And I said, what do you mean, that is it? She's like, you'll see when you get there. So we found the arch, we walked around, and she was right, that was it. In 1979, after coming back and forth to Greenwich Village on weekends with different people, I said to the, 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 two, the three main people that I always came with, I'm going to live here one day. And I remember them, you know, we're 17 now. They looked at me, you're going to live in Greenwich Village? We live in New Jersey. I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to live here one day. And they're like, what are you going to do? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> but from 1979 to 1999, I did a lot of research, not knowing what I was going to, not research on a business, just research for myself and for my friends and family. I wanted to find the best mom and pop ethnic places that I could find. I wanted to find the best hidden music venues. And I wanted to speak to the people that actually lived in Greenwich Village. So for me to speak to the owner of like a falafel stand that was from Turkey, 
was the biggest thrill ever because I didn't know anyone from Turkey back then. I've never had a falafel. So the first, you know, before that even happened, I, I, I stood in front of the falafel stand, you know, probably four or five weekends just staring at what was in the window. And finally he came out and noticed that we were there. And he said, what are you looking at? What are you doing? So we spoke to this guy and it was fascinating. And, and there was a hundred stories like that. So basically to make a long story short, in 1979, in 1999, um, I decided that it's time to actually do something with all the knowledge that I had. And I said, I'm going to put an ad in the New York magazine, in a, yeah, New York magazine, in the weekend section, and all it's going to say is Greenwich Village food tour. I didn't even have a food tour. <laughs> I was just doing this as a market study to figure out if anyone was interested. I came home from work on a Thursday. I guess the, the, the magazine came out on a Thursday, and this is the day, in, the day and age of the answering machines. And I noticed it was blinking and it said 60. <laughs> and I'm just thinking that, oh, you know, somebody called over and over and whatever. I listened to it and it said, uh, we're interested in your Greenwich Village food tour. And that's what it was for 60 messages. So I had to, it took me three days to listen to those messages because Everyone, they blurred out their phone number so fast, I couldn't get it. So after listening to everything, I called everyone back and I said, the Greenwich Village food tour is booked for the next month. <laughs> exactly. So what I had to do then was put together a Greenwich Village food tour. And I did. I had them meet me on a corner, 7th Avenue and Bleecker Street. I spoke to my friends, and when I, when I say my friends, I spoke to the, the owner of Murray's Cheese Shop, the owner of Faico's Pork Store, the owner of Rocco's, the owner of Joe's Pizza, and many others to let them know what I was doing, and they said, what is a food tour? Because in 1999, that didn't actually exist. So I explained to them, I said, I'm going to tell your story to 15 people. We're going to taste some of your highlights, you know, if it was... Murray's, three different types of cheeses, some olives, and hopefully they're going to come back and shop because I want them to support you guys. That's, that's what my goal was. My, my dad owned a butcher shop in New Jersey, and unfortunately the big supermarkets put him out of business. So what I, my goal was to keep these mom and pop shops in Greenwich Village supported by the people that we tour. And it's not just about, you know, this is cheese for Murray's, it's about telling the story. You know, uh, Faico's has been around for over 100 years. There's a story there. It's a rich story. You know, what um, Calvin was saying about the, the buildings, when people walk by a building in Greenwich Village and they see bricks, they don't know if this is Flemish bond. They don't know what type of brick. They don't know when the building was actually built or who lived there in 1890. That's what we tell them. So it's a combination of history, culture, architecture, and we try to educate whoever is interested. Um, it's not just for food lovers, it's for everyone. So that's why getting an award like this, you know, for me, knowing that in 1977 that this was the place is, is pretty amazing to me. And um, the thing is, this award is, is phenomenal for me, but it's also for them. Um, it's a, it's a business that is seven days a week. So this is not something I can run alone. So there are 17 people to help me. And it's not just the, the tour guides. We have a great office staff. This is Amy. She's, she sits right next to me. I, I don't have a separate office. We're in a little studio apartment, and we, we do it all. And some of the other tour guides. But the biggest part is the relationships that we have with the neighborhood the local people, and all the shops. So that whole combination makes it work, and I thank you, Greenwich Village. Um, the next recipient is Marilyn Appleberg.
When Marilyn Appleberg moved to a walk-up apartment on 10th Street in the East Village in 1969, her father jokingly called it a run-up instead of a walk-up <laughs> because of the crime rate. Uh, I actually uh, knew somebody whose daughter moved to that neighborhood of two or three years after that, and um, she got her own apartment. It was her first apartment, and her father went over to take her to dinner to celebrate and to see the apartment, and, he, and the door was flopping open, and there was graffiti all over, and, and the windows didn't look safe. And he looked around the apartment where he picked her up to go to dinner, and he said, um, are you going to want to take anything with you? <laughs> and she said, what do you mean? He said, you're not coming back here. There's this, <laughs> this is it for you, we're going to dinner. You, um, Marilyn Appleberg, either her father didn't say that or she totally ignored him. And she's lived on the block ever since helping to transform the neighborhood along the way. She joined the East 10th and Stuyvesant Street Block Association, quickly became president, a position she held for many years. In the 80s, Marilyn led the community in fighting two large developments on Third Avenue. She extended the St. Mark's Historic District, was instrumental in having the district placed on the National Register of Historic Places. In the 1990s, she helped organize a local merchants association on 2nd Avenue. Perhaps her biggest accomplishment is revitalizing what is na was now Abe Liebewald Park, the open triangle facing the St. Mark's Church on 2nd Avenue. She persuaded her neighbors to volunteer for regular trash removal duties, convinced the local liquor store to stop selling pint-sized bottles of liquor, invited the Green Market to set up a weekly market, and work with the nearby Third Street Music School, Music School Settlement, he successfully petitioned to have the park renamed for him. Not one to stop there, she even pressed for the passage of a law to ensure the name of the park would remain permanent, rather than New York version of perpetuity. <laughs> this summer will mark 31 years of concerts in the park, and the Green Market continues to operate on Tuesdays in the summer and fall. Marilyn Appleberg receives a Village Award for giving over 40 years of selfless and outstanding service to the East 10th and Stuyvesant Street blocks and East Village as a community leader and neighborhood activist. Please join me on the stage to accept your award. I arrived um, in the East Village when it was the Lower East Side, um, that 43 years ago. Um, my apartment looked like the set of La Boheme, and it was as cold, but I thought that was a really good thing. Um, there were a lot of battles going on then, and um, I think mostly we were, we were battling city administrations who thought that the only way that we could get rid of the, the drugs and the prostitutes was to allow Third Avenue to be upzoned, as if R10 meant no prostitutes and no drug dealers. Um, but the, extending the historic district and reclaiming what was a space in front of a national historic landmark that at, we were worse off than the Bleecker Street because no one fessed up to owning it. And I had to find an old city map and see that it was property number M188 and get the parks to, uh, department to come in and deal with it. We've become great partners with the parks department and Commissioner Castro is helping us at this moment. Um, I want to single out, Abe Liebewall was an amazing angel in our community. And when everybody told me the park couldn't be anything else, he said, how can I help? And so naming the park for him was a no-brainer. And the other person I need to take my hat off to is Beth Flusser, because I went to her and I said, do you think we could do 
concerts in the park because we need to repurpose this park. And she just said yes over one of our first lunches. And today we had the first concert, um, beginning of our 31st year. And so, please. We have, we have world-class, in the beginning, the, the, the artists weren't wonderful, and so the chopped liver from the 2nd Avenue Deli kept the audience there. But now, we have incredible talent, and um, it, we go on every Thursday in June and July at uh, 12.30 in the afternoon, and Veselka uh, provides brownies at the end. Um, I, wanna get, I, want, I want to thank Greenwich Village Society for this incredible honor. And I want to dedicate it to a wonderful woman we just lost, Georgia Delano. Forty years ago, Georgia Delano was at a, a little gathering we had on the block. And I asked her why she and her husband and her four children came out every Saturday morning and cleaned the block from end to end. And she said to me, because we live here. And that was about as much courage, encouragement as I needed. And 40 years, and hopefully I'll do 40 more years. So, thank you. I would have sat through almost anything for that chopped liver. Um, I come from Kansas City, and I spoke once at the... Uh, at a Chicago Jewish center, the rabbi insisted that there had to be a um, title to the speech, and he liked titles with uh, long titles with colons in the middle. Uh, and so I gave uh, my title was Midwestern Jews colon making chopped liver with miracle whip. <laughs> uh, um, After the speech, a woman came up to me and said, the title was a very interesting metaphor. And I said, alas, madam, um, that was a recipe. That was uh, my mother's recipe. Um, our, our, our final award, I think it's the final. No, it isn't the final. The penultimate award is to uh, the Little Red Schoolhouse at Elizabeth Irwin High School. Ninety years ago, educator, psychologist, and reformer Elizabeth Irwin founded the Little Red Schoolhouse, an experimental curriculum in the annex of PS61 in the village. The school has grown over the years. It is now an independent school offering a 14-year experience for students. Little Red continues its progressive curriculum of social justice, active censorship, citizenship, and community service. <laughs> um, I, just, I just realized that, that the editor of The Nation, uh, who I call the wily and parsimonious Victor S. Navasky, uh, because of what he was willing to pay me, um, went to Elizabeth Irwin and claimed to have been on the second five of the basketball team. Uh, we found that people, this was while we were playing basketball with Navasky, and we found that very difficult to believe. And then I realized that it's always been a very progressive place, and so it's to encourage, to stop any kind of sectarian disputes in the PTA. They had diversity on the basketball team, so they'd have like a Stalinist forward, uh, a Shockmanite guard, and that sort of thing. Novasky uh, was on the team as a token exploiter. Um, Elizabeth Irwin began her career as a reformer in the settlement movement in the Lower East Side. And she began, began the pilot program that would become Little Red in 1921. She emphasized the importance of play and the cultivation of the imagination. There were no recitations or textbooks, no report cards or corporal punishment. 
It sounds sort of like PS3. Um, students explore the community around them on frequent field trips and express themselves through storytelling, writing, painting, block building, singing, dancing, and performing. In essence, at Little Red, students learn by doing both then and now. Budget cuts forced the, the, the closure of Little Red as a public school during the Great Depression, but parents and reformers raised funds to open it as a private institution. Eleanor Roosevelt was an outspoken supporter of Irwin and served on the board of advisor for decades. The school remained com committed to its origins of public service, serving a diverse student population at a low cost. In 1941, the school expanded to include a high school, which opened on Charlton Street and expanded again in 2010 with the purchase of a neighboring townhouse. Little Red Elizabeth Irvin was founded on and continues to promote the ideals of reform and progressivism, ideals that speak to and build upon the larger history of the village. A village award is presented at the Little Red Schoolhouse, Elizabeth Irvin High School, for 90 years. This is their 90th anniversary. As a trailblazer of progressive education for children of diverse backgrounds in an inspiring environment which fosters true inquiry and learning. Little Red's current director, Phil Kasson, will accept the award this evening. Thank you to the Society for including us in the slate of this evening's honoree. It's a distinguished group, and we're happy to be there. And I'd always heard that um, Victor was a starting forward, so he's telling some tales when he comes back to visit. We know, as we've looked at the school's history um, quite deeply this year, our 90th year, that had we not landed at 196 Bleecker Street and had the high school not landed at 40 Charlton Street a few years later, we would not be the school we are now. That the village helped create the school as much as the teachers who started and Elizabeth Irwin herself. And we know that our students have the terrific experience they do because they walk the streets every day, they visit your stores, they look at your buildings, and they soak up the history of the village as they think about what it means to be a New Yorker and a citizen. So for that, for this evening's award, and for being our neighbors, which we hope to be for many years to come, I thank you on behalf of the school. Thank you. Thank you. Our final award goes to City Council Member Rosie Mendez. Rosie Mendez was first elected to the City Council to represent the East Village and parts of NoHo in the Central Village, among other areas, in 2005. I'm curious about the Central Village. Uh, I used to live in Greenwich Village, and then I woke up one morning and I lived in the West Village. Uh, my house had not moved. My, uh, uh, I'm still not sure where, well anyway. She has distinguished herself as a strong advocate for public housing, women's rights, affordable housing, and LGBT equality. But she has also distinguished herself as a staunch advocate for historic preservation and protecting neighborhoods against overdevelopment. One of her first acts as a city council member was to join GVSHP and neighbors in protesting NYU's plans for, I don't think we're gonna be able to use NYU's auditorium next year. <laughs> I just thought of that. I hope this is available, because I think... <laughs> that, no, I, uh, uh, <laughs> Rosie has joined GVSHP in fighting for the preservation of endangered historic sites, just such as 35 Cooper Square. She hasn't stopped there. In 2008, she helped GVSHP and a vast array of community groups achieve a rezoning of nearly the entire East Village and establishing sensible height limits for the first time in most of the neighborhood. <laughs> the 
With Rosie's help, GVSHP and allied groups were able to get the city to hold an emergency hearing on the East 10th Street Historic District designated earlier this year and to get the city to expand and propose East Village Lower East Side Historic District to include key sites GVSHP has fought to protect, including 101 Avenue A and the Russian Orthodox Cathedral on East 2nd Street, which Andrew mentioned. While not every fight can be won, Rosie has always stood up for preservation on the city council and was the lone member of that body to vote against the de-landmarking of an early 19th century house at 135 Bowery in a church house in Queens. For outstanding, <laughs> for outstanding leadership on preservation issues locally and citywide, and for champion diverse need, championing diverse needs and interest groups to foster more livable communities in the East Village, NoHo, and Greenwich Village. A Village Award is presented to City Council Member Rosie Mendez. <laughs> Council Member Mendez, please join me. Good evening. It's such an honor to be here and to be honored with my friend Marilyn and with my neighbors at the 6th Street, Sixth Street Bee Garden. Um, when I was elected, uh, when I was running for office, I ran on a platform of community-based planning. And for the last six and a half years, I've tried to make sure that my community has been involved in the process of planning for, for our neighborhood, whether it's renovating our public parks, the two rezonings that we did with GVSHP, and or just looking long-term at, at our community needs. I've made sure that my neighbors have been at the table. But when I got elected six and a half years ago, I realized that I was given not just a privilege, but a great responsibility. Because as you saw from the uh, pictures of the 6th Street BC Garden, B Garden, and if you saw in the background in Maryland's pictures, you saw abandoned buildings and lots. Um, our community, what Maryland and I still call the Lower East Side, was devastated during the 1970s, during the fiscal crisis. The Bronx wasn't the only thing that was burning. It was the Lower East Side. And while I lived across the river in Williamsburg, in another now trendy neighborhood, um, it was people like Marilyn and the gardeners and my predecessor, Margarita Lopez, who all came together to rescue and preserve this community. They removed the rubble and created gardens. They took over the empty school buildings and created uh, community and cultural centers, and they took those empty lots, those empty buildings, shell of a building, and they made low-income housing. And so um, when I got elected, I had to carry on that great tradition of all the activists in my community. Um, I consider myself lucky, and I look forward every day to going to work, to doing this, um, working for my community, and uh, especially one of my joys, sitting on the subcommittee on landmarks. I'm afraid I'm going to come in one day to the city council and they're going to remove me from that committee. But as all of us know, our preservation work is perpetual and it's imbued with our shared desire to protect and demand respect for the sustained character of our community. Community character is diverse, it is an amalgamation of people, places, environment, history, and energy. Is it, a, it is a concept that through the work of GVSHP and all my neighbors um, that must be respected and ultimately it's about people, it's about us, it's about you, me, it's about our buildings that tell our stories, our history, and 
defines our character and our communities. Um, I look forward to continuing our shared work to preserving not just the Lower East Side or the East Village, but the West Village, Central Village. <laughs> I gotta go visit that. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. It is such an honor. Everyone, please, uh, please, first of all, join me in thanking all of our awardees uh, tonight. What a wonderful group. Um, I'd, I'd almost forgotten how after our annual awards, I, I can't stop smiling for a good two or three days. I mean, it's just, it's just such a wonderful joy. And of course, our host and presenter for the evening, Calvin Trillin, for doing such a marvelous, marvelous job. Um, and, and thank you to all of you for joining us here tonight. And of course, now the, the party and the reception begins, so I hope you'll um, stick around for that. I'll ask the trustees of uh, the society to stay here, come to the front. We have, to have, we have some quick business we need to take care of, but I'll ask everybody, if you just uh, exit out the, the door there, you'll be directed to where the reception is. Um, and please enjoy, and thank you so much for joining us for the evening. <laughs>